I'm delighted to be joined today by a very, very distinguished panel. And we also have uh, Minister Nadim Zahavi with us today. Nadim, welcome. And we'll come to you shortly after the other panelists introduce themselves. Thank you, much appreciated. Um, I'm just going to give you the objectives for this session and what we're trying to achieve today, and I hope we'll get there, and I'm confident that we will with the panel available, discuss the key findings from the SAGE report and the UK government's response to driving COVID-19 vaccine uptake in ethnic minority populations. Secondly, we want to understand what actions can be taken to overcome barriers and how can we mobilize communities and engage at grassroots level. So we're very solutions orientated today. Uh, and uh, with a view to that, we want to share innovative examples um, of community and faith leaders and healthcare professionals driving up, up uptake in challenge and cha challenged areas and challenging areas. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go to our panel Kamlesh, uh, tell us who you are. Uh, hi, I'm Kamlesh Kinti. I'm a trustee of the South Asian Health Foundation. Also chair the SAGE uh, um, subgroup on ethnicity, and I'm a member of the Independent SAGE as well. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Kamlesh. Sue, tell us who you are. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Sue Harriman, and uh, I'm a member of the uh, COVID deployment team uh, working nationally. Um, my normal day job is I'm a chief exec of an NHS provider organisation down in Hampshire, so it's been my complete privilege to work with the deployment team for the, for the last five months. Fabulous. Thank you, Sue, and thanks for joining us. Deenan, hello. Tell us who you are. Hi, uh, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dean and Pillay. I'm professor of virology at UCL and a clinical virologist at University College Hospital. Also sit on Independent Sage. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. And Lilu, your turn. Tell us who you are. Hello. Sorry about the. Uh, <laughs> um, my name is Lilu Wheeler. I um, am a lay reviewer for the National Institute of Health Research, and I'm also a. Um, a staff member, a project manager at East London NHS um, Trust. Very good. Thanks, Lulu. You're looking settled in now. Very good. Atia, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Atia Kamal. I'm a health psychologist and senior lecturer at Birmingham City University. I, I'm also um, on the ethnicity subgroup with Camlish and a member of the SPIB subgroup and um, behavioural sciences subgroup of SAGE. Thank you, Athea, and welcome. Harpreet, do introduce yourself. We've lost you on video. We'll come back to Harpreet soon. Thank you. Oh, you're there. OK. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Cameron. Good evening. Um, I'm Harpreet Sood. I'm a GP in South London. I'm also, also a trustee of the South Asian Health Foundation, and I also sit on the board of health. Harpreet, we're having some connection problems with you, but uh, I think we got oh, we got you back. We've got that. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Harpreet because Harpreet's been instrumental in making this uh, webinar happen today. So much appreciated. It's a very important thing you've done. So without further ado, over to Minister Nadim Zahavi, who's the minister, very importantly, for vaccine deployment. Nadim. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Cameron. And what a panel uh, we have tonight. Um, actually, um, rather than uh, sort of speaking at you, I want to uh, also just really listen and hopefully learn uh, from colleagues on this call as, as to what is working and what we need to do more of uh, and, and sort of the, the, the practitioner view in many ways is hugely important and powerful in terms of uh, you know, what I think is that is a, a, a uh, incredibly important task, a challenge in many ways of making sure that all the hard to reach groups, uh, including, of course, the AME community, uh, we reach with uh, the variety of, of um, evidence and communication uh, to hopefully allow them to make a um, reasoned uh, an evidence-based judgment in terms of protecting themselves and of course protecting their families and their communities the united kingdom i think in many ways 
uh, and I had a message. I used to be, some of you will know this, I used to be uh, uh, the founder of YouGov. Uh, I still am the founder of YouGov, but I left. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I had a, a lovely text message, actually an email from uh, what was then a competitor uh, uh, called Ipsos Mori. Many of you will know Ipsos Mori, uh, yeah. research agency. Uh, and Page, who leads that organization, emailed me a few days ago to say, and the subject line basically said, no government has hit 90% ever on any policy. Uh, uh, but we're, we're, we're hitting some sort of 89% approval in terms of the vaccine deployment policy and uh, the, the way we have uh, uh, delivered that and, of course, supported the deployment of the NHS. And, and, and it's great to have Sue here uh, with me as well. Essentially, the uh, vaccine acceptance in the United Kingdom is incredibly high. We are, I think, um, the, the highest country in terms of uh, the adult population saying they are very likely or most likely to take a vaccine 85 percent uh, in the latest poll i saw I think the ons ha had a similar figure the office for national statistics my fear is that the 15 percent uh, that are uh, vaccine hesitant skew heavily towards uh, bame communities and uh, many of you on this uh, call and on this panel are far more knowledgeable than i i'm a chemical engineer not a virologist or an expert in the field, but the, but even I know that when viruses attempt to survive, they will, uh, of course, mutate, but they'll also try and find communities uh, and, 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 and humans to infect. And if there's a particular uh, ethnic community, um, especially ones that by definition are quite closely knit, the virus gets into that community and it's not protected whilst the rest of the adult population is. Uh, then it will go through them like wildfire and something that we want to avoid at all costs. Um, we have stood up, I think, one of the uh, uh, biggest um, deployment programs in the history of vaccinations in the NHS and the history of vaccination in the United Kingdom. Uh, as Brigadier Phil Prosser, which some of you become familiar with, who uh, is the commander of 101 um, Logistics Brigade, who's embedded in our team, in the group, um, uh, uh, pointed out when he did the press conference with the Prime Minister a few, month, a few weeks ago, that it's a bit like standing up a national supermarket chain and then growing it 20% uh, every week. Uh, and all credit, and I feel a bit like a, a, an imposter because the real credit is to Sue Harriman and, and Emily Lawson, who's supposed to be with us tonight, and the many, many others uh, on the uh, operations team, but of course the thousands uh, of uh, uh, volunteers and GPs and nurses and pharmacists uh, uh, across the NHS family uh, have made this uh, possible uh, uh, as a deployment. Uh, uh, probably, if you work it out, probably the most successful vaccine deployment in, in, in up to date in history. And I hope we carry on being successful. It's eight weeks in one day since we, uh, uh, you know, literally uh, rolled out the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine in, in a few hospital hubs. Uh, and then that week uh, expanded into primary care networks and then, of course, into national vaccination centers and pharmacies uh, uh, and so on. Um, so a, a massive thank you to the whole team. Uh, I guess from where I'm sitting, one of the questions I would love uh, us to focus on tonight is, of, of course, uh, you know, we've done incredibly well in offering the vaccine to uh, residents of elderly care homes and those who look after them. I want to see how I can drive up the uh, uh, increase in the number of, of people who work in those care homes from BAME communities, who work in our NHS from BAME community, uh, because they're very much part of those top four cohorts that we need to meet by uh, uh, next Monday of offering them the, the vaccine. And of course, going through the rest of the JCBI cohorts to uh, five to nine as well, uh, and it's 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 those sort of challenges that, that you know, I want us to work, not just as a group here, but I've tried to make it as cross party as I can. I've done a you know, an op ed with with Khan. I've done uh, some fantastic videos with South Asian MPs and and Black and and uh, African Caribbean colleagues in Parliament. And there is more to do. Um, this week, I will hopefully present uh, to Parliament uh, 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 our uptake strategy very much led by the NHS with local government, 
no government very much embedded into that. We've got the brilliant Eleanor Kelly, who's joined us from Southwark, who's leading on the local government initiative, because I think local government needs to be brought into this to be able to identify those community leaders, those uh, faith leaders, and of course, identify the communities themselves and be able to, to communicate with them. We're translating everything into 13 languages. So a massive, massive effort. Uh, but thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Cameron and others on this call for having me on. You are, the, 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 in many ways, uh, our, our most effective conduit uh, or, or pipe to the people because uh, you are the trusted voices uh, to many uh, uh, communities uh, as the medical practitioners. And uh, Harpreet and I have, have, have talked about this in the past, as I have with Bazana as well. I, I know I saw her name uh, on, come up on the screen. Uh, earlier than others, but we need to do more, much, much more, because ultimately uh, we've had amazing uptake from the over 80s, you know, uh, uh, you know, way above 90%, over 75, same thing. We're heading that way with the over 70s when we were modeling at 75% uptake. Um, uh, the NHS model was 75% was, was uptake would have been really, really good. Um, we're way ahead of that. We want to be the same in, in BAME communities, especially in those four top cohorts, as I say, and then going beyond that into five, six, seven, eight, eight, nine. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you very much for that. And clearly the deployment has been a remarkable success. So congratulations to you and your team for that. There is a concern though, and then you, you touched upon it. Can I just ask you uh, around the, in many ways at the beginning of the pandemic, I think minorities were very prominent as a high risk group. Um, and there's a, there's a worry, of course, that they were left out of the research for various reasons. They weren't identified amongst, amongst the research. We'll, we'll hear more about that soon, I'm sure. But in terms of prioritisation for vaccination, um, they were, I mean, and I, I appreciate you're announcing a strategy next week, but I think minorities weren't visible uh, in that priority list. Can you clarify that and explain why that was? Yeah, absolutely, um, Cameron. So uh, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation and colleagues here will will uh, uh, you know, are much closer to the committee uh, than I am. Uh, we effectively gave them the the the, the, the remit to uh, collect the evidence, to analyse the evidence, and then to report back to us as to what the prioritisation should be. And they looked at uh, different cohorts, BAME. Uh, cohorts, of course, they looked at professions working with the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, and they fell very clearly uh, on the uh, prioritization of the one to nine based very much on clinical evidence that it is age related. And then, of course, in category four, it is you know, people who are clinically extremely vulnerable. And then category six, which is people with underlying ailments, you know, diabetics and others, which is 16 to 64 year old that will be in category six of quite a large uh, part, you know, cohort in the population. Um, and so we're following the JCVI and we're going back to them now, of course, to, to, to get, you know, gather the evidence for phase two and asking the question around professions, whether police officers or uh, BAME communities or um, teachers and others um, as to what should be the prioritization for phase two. Um, as we move rapidly through now, obviously, uh, five, six, seven, eight, and nine uh, cohorts. Uh, so th they felt very clearly after looking at all the evidence on BAME and others that that was the, the, the race against death and to reduce the sort of hospitalization, of serious illness and, and, and death, then the one to nine was, was, was the clearest evidence for that. Okay, good. Well, th thanks, Nadeem. And um, I'm sure we'll get into some of these issues during the next hour and 15 minutes. Uh, before, before we move on, can I just ask you then, if, if you're making an announcement next week, can you give us any indications of the of one or two measures that you, you think are important? Well, I hope I'll be, I'll be saying, actually, I'll, I'll be saying more about it on Friday. And it's okay. very much around um, a national strategy, a regional strategy, and then a hyper-local strategy. And actually, one of the most important things was in your earlier remarks or openings, um, uh, and it's clearly something that you've been thinking about as well, uh, Cameron, and that is how do we take uh, knowledge of what really works and share it? You know, mm. what, what do we put in place that, that people can access um, uh, you know, through 
um, local government um, and uh, you know, directors of public health with the NHS of you know, where, what has worked, how has it worked, and then how do you operationalize it in other areas? Uh, so there's a big, big focus very much on that. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Well, I hope this conversation is going to help you uh, think about those things a, a little more deeply as well. Well, th Nadine, thank you very much. And um, good of you again to join us today. And we appreciate those opening remarks that you made um, and your support for what we're doing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn first of all to Kamlesh. Kamlesh, over to you. And Kamlesh is going to talk about um, the historical context of vaccine uptake and findings from the SAGE report. Kamlesh. That's great. Um, uh, Minister Zahavi, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Cameron, um, thanks for chairing your heart rate. Thanks for arranging this. Can you see my slides? Yeah, we can. Excellent. So I'm just going to, over the next five minutes, just take you through the historical context to this. Uh, this is part of the SAGE uh, report that we published from the Ethnicity SAGE subgroup. I will give the background, Atiyah will give uh, the context into the barriers and potential methods to overcome these barriers. Um, so vaccine hesitancy among ethnic minority groups, we've been talking about this uh, recently, but it's not something that we didn't expect. So in terms of uh, this program of work we did for, for the SAGE, uh, we knew that the success of the UK's national COVID vaccination program will depend significantly on the uptake of the program and we also wanted to find out what are the barriers and potential targeted interventions to overcome these barriers. And few studies had previously examined uptake uh, on vaccination data by ethnic minority groups or uh, indeed other groups. This is the SAGE report that we published very early on in the pandemic and we know who is affected the most. We've been talking about it just now. There's a, a comorbidities, ethnic minorities, uh, people who come from deprived areas, age is a big driver, and, and obesity. And there are other factors as well, and occupation is one that's already been mentioned. So as part of this uh, uh, Q research, Julia Hipsley cox did this analysis uh, for us with 12 million adults and children registered into 1,300 general practices. And what we found is that the previous uh, vaccination program, these are the ones that we all know about, influenza, pneumococcal, and shingles, there was a reduced uptake in um, black populations, 50% uptake uh, compared to the white populations. And within the South Asian groups, the Pakistani group had significantly low vaccine uptake. And there were recent uh, vaccination programs, the rotavirus and shingles, we wanted to see what the uptake of this was, any new vaccination programs. And again, we found that uh, compared to the white population, it was about 20, 10 to 20% lower. If you look at this, this is a, a looking at the, compared to white population as the uh, category. Uh, you see Bangladeshi and Asians much lower uptake, deprived populations here much lower uptake. And the interesting one we can come to later on, larger the household size, the lower uptake. And there is an implication for that because the larger household sizes have had the worst outcomes. Bangladeshi population here, see, you see in the full uh, vaccination program, is increased uptake. And the reason is 75% of the Bangladeshis in this database reside within East End of London. And they've been working for many, many years to improve vaccine uptake, both the community leaders and uh, the GP practice as well. And that's why we think they have a better uptake compared to the white population. Same results for pneumonia vaccination program. For singles, the new vaccination programs, you see reduced uptake for all ethnic minorities. So there is something about anything new that comes through there is some concerns about that. Uh, in terms of the pattern for deprivation and household size, that still remains. This is showing a, a recent uh, 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 program of attitudes towards COVID vaccination, un the Understanding Society study of 11,800 participants. And again, we could have guessed from here that we were gonna have issues in terms of vaccine hesitancy among the black and the Asian groups vaccine hesitancy of 70% of the black uh, uh, population, uh, about 40% for the South Asian uh, populations. And then finally, we now have early data, and this is from the Open Safely study, um, seeing the early uh, data for the white population uptake 40%, South Asian 30%, and the black population uh, uh, 20%. Exactly what we've mirrored previously in other vaccination programs. 
And in terms of deprivation, again, we see the most deprived, less likely to uh, get the vaccination. So in summary, certain populations will, we know are disproportionately affected, the elderly deprived, those with comorbidities and from ethnic minority backgrounds. So vaccine hesitancy has been known from previous vaccination programs. We really should have prepared for this, but I'm glad that we're doing something and, and really congratulations to uh, uh, Minister Zahavi for uh, one of the, the best programs in the world. Um, but now we're seeing the rollout of the program, we are seeing a number of barriers and hesitancy among certain groups, and particularly the ethnic minority and the deprived populations. And I'll, I'll just set the scene here. I'm happy to take questions now, otherwise we'll move on to Tia who can give some of the barriers and solutions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Kamish, thank you. I'll ask you one question before we move on to Tia. I mean, the data you showed uh, amongst ethnic minorities, it's particularly the, the black, um, uh, population and also the Pakistani uh, population, my own um, the, the ethnic minority group that was um, primarily, you know, affected. What is the reason? Because if we, uh, for example, Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities are probably very similar in terms of socio-economic status. Um, could you tell us a bit more about what, why that difference exists? Then you mean in, in terms of the disproportionate affection? Or yeah, the yeah. Uh, well, right. the, the va vaccine uptake. So vaccine uptake, Atiyah is going to come to that shortly. She's going to give the data for potential okay. barriers and solutions. But I can tell you now that we, when we came first into the pandemic, we saw that all ethnic minorities were equally affected, disproportionately affected, higher rates by two to three times higher mortality. We okay. just got the data now, just published preprint, and it's uh, with your journal, Cameron, showing <laughs> that we have improved this disproportionate impact in the black community. So there isn't any difference between the white minority, white uh, group and the black communities, but there is still a disproportionate impact in mortality for South Asians, in particularly the Pakistani and the Bangladeshi group. And okay. there are many reasons for this. And we think one of the reasons is the household size. Those two mm. populations have a larger household size, higher household density in multi-generational families living together as well. And maybe we okay. could discuss that later in terms of vaccination programs for that. Yeah, I think we definitely should. Thanks, Kamlesh, for that. Thank you very much. Atia, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, I haven't unmuted. Bear with me. It's fine. <laughs> Where am I? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and yeah. we can see your slides. You can see the slides, fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm going to share with you a review of the evidence um, around strategies, well, some of the barriers um, to understanding um, uptake in uh, vaccines of, um, from minority ethnic communities, but then also some of the strategies to address those. So um, in terms of barriers to uptake, and um, this draws on not just what we know during um, the current pandemic, but also um, evidence from previous um, vaccination programmes, such as H1N1 and, and some of those um, that Kamlish mentioned. So what we know is that there is lower trust and confidence in vaccine efficacy, efficacy and safety in minority ethnic groups. Um, so uh, the reasons for this vary. So for some black groups, um, it is that low trust um, results from historical issues of unethical healthcare research. For, for other groups, such as the, some South Asian communities, there's low trust um, due to experiences of, of racism, which undermines trust within the healthcare services, but also um, concerns around um, the effectiveness uh, due to the lack of representation within healthcare research more broadly. You know, do the findings translate just as well to minority ethnic communities? So, so there are concerns, there are issues that relate to trust and that's the biggest barrier um, that, uh, that exists. But other barriers are more psychological in nature. So there are differences in perceptions of risk. So some groups have a lower perception of risk. So um, young males, for example, um, some traveler communities um, believe that they've got a strong immune system and so they won't need a, a vaccine. So it's really important to understand what kind of beliefs and attitudes people hold in relation to the vaccine. There are also practical issues, some of those more social factors that influence our behaviour as well. So um, access barriers, where, where is the vaccine being offered, um, the cost, the time, the distance required to travel. These kind of factors um, create sort of additional additional barriers and challenges. Um, and also there is uh, there are some sort of contextual and socio-demographic factors as well. So there are 
concerns um, and are, that are rooted in cultural and religious concerns. And these are not a specific 21 faithful group. You know, once we sort of had a look at the evidence, actually, um, concerns that relate to faith are not, um, they're not uh, isolated to one particular faith community. They, they cut across several faiths, for example, you know, the Abrahamic faiths. And um, there's something more overarching in terms of the concerns. Also, um, in minority ethnic communities, endorsement from trusted providers is key, and healthcare workers are one of those trusted sources. The challenge here is healthcare workers from minority ethnic communities are more likely to be vaccine hesitant, and so that endorsement doesn't exist, um, not as much as we would like it to. So these are the barriers that we've identified, and of course, Recognising the barriers then allows us to um, develop targeted strategies and solutions to address this. And what we can see is that um, this will require a multifaceted and multimodal approach. You know, different communities experience different um, barriers and we should avoid these broad catch-all type interventions because they're unlikely to meet the needs of specific communities. So they may not be as effective and actually they might exacerbate health inequalities. Um, so some of the strategies that the evidence shows has increased vaccine uptake in minority ethnic communities is ongoing community engagement. And this can really address the issue of trust, having that open dialogue with communities, um, addressing their concerns, providing the reassurance of the safety and efficacy. Um, and it's really important that um, this dialogue includes trusted sources from within the community. Um, so those would be the scientists and GPs primarily in the context of vaccines. And um, hearing, you know, hearing, the, um, hearing the data or you know, the approval process or addressing their concerns um, directly from these members of the community can increase confidence, trust, knowledge and acceptability of the, um, of the vaccine. Um, Community engagement can also address some of the uh, practical support that, can, uh, that is required. So some of the um, strategies that can make the vaccine more accessible in terms of settings, you know, some communities uh, would be open to a place of worship offering the vaccine, but other communities won't. And we need to ensure that there's no financial disadvantage because quite often, um, you know, well, what we know is a large proportion of um, um, ethnic minority communities are also, um, you know, in, in more deprived areas. Um, so um, one of the key strategies that will underpin all of this is good communication. You know, communication, whether that is verbal, um, in terms of engaging with those trusted um, leaders or communications in terms of verbal, um, I'm sorry, in terms of written in the form of leaflets or animated or WhatsApp videos, for example. Um, and there are principles that underpin how we develop tailored health messages for ethnic minority communities, but these are primarily co-designed and co-created um, with communities and um, delivered using multiple sources, multiple media um, and multiple languages. Um, and finally, given the importance of healthcare staff and um, their endorsement within these communities, we do feel that training for healthcare staff um, would be helpful um, so that they recognise their role as a trusted source of information. And I'd like to end on a, on, a, on a word of caution. What we saw in some of the earlier stages of the pandemic was one of the unintended consequences of um, targeting ethnic minority communities was um, stigma and dis, you know um, perceptions mm. of discrimination and racialized explanations for you know increased or disproportionate impact of um, you know of of, um, um, of COVID and what we what we need to be cautious of at this stage is we need to avoid. Um, you know, if there is lower initial uptake, uh, we need to avoid highlighting that as, as being problematic. And actually, we need more supportive measures to understand what the issues are and engage with communities in a, in a meaningful, relevant way. Um, importantly, um, stigma is linked to less engagement with healthcare services. So it becomes counterproductive if, if, um, if this negative narr narrative um, becomes mainstream and, um, and might sort of go against all of the efforts and um, that we're, we're all um, putting into trying to increase uptake in this community. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, we'll, we'll get into some of the solutions later as well in, in, in the Q&A. Can I ask you a quick question about trust? I think trust is clearly a very important issue here. Um, my experience is that generally Asian communities, black communities, ethnic minorities trust health professionals what is it about vaccines 
that makes them makes that trust evaporate it's the unknown and i think it's a completely rational response to um to be unsure or to to wait um, before taking a vaccine and and the reasons differ and this is why the engagement is so important because for one for one subset it could be um you know based on their scientific knowledge and understanding that there is a lack of representation for people in minority groups in, in the trials and what that could mean for them. For others, it does stem from those historical issues or the unknown side effects. Um, and, and there are examples in, in the past of side effects becoming apparent a little bit later. So, so I think the reasons are, are varied. Um, and, you know, I, but I think primarily the distrust is, is, is the unknown. You know, what are the side effects? We're already seeing a, a slight change in towards increasing positive attitudes as more and more people are getting vaccinated because it's addressing the concern of, you know, is it safe? So we, we and, and there is evidence to um, that, that shows, you know, as as it's the outcome expectations. You know, they can see that something, uh, the person who has had the vaccine hasn't, um, is still alive um, or hasn't had any severe side effects. And those, sharing those positive stories will be really important over the course of the next few months, just to allay some of these perfectly reasonable fears. And it's our job to engage with those um, and understand what they are and address them. Nadia, thank you. Um, I'm just conscious that, um... We've got uh, Mr. Zawi here for, with us, perhaps another 10, 15 minutes or so. So I'm, I'm getting some questions through for you, Nadim. Would you mind taking one or two now? Yes. Um, I mean, one of the, I mean, there's a theme which is around what I asked you about prioritization. Th thank you, we'll come back to you, um, ab about prioritization, um, which is, Kamla showed the evidence there. Uh, people are arguing we have enough evidence of risk in ethnic minorities. Why aren't ethnic minorities, particularly those uh, on the front lines, being prioritised for vaccination? And then that extends to the communities as well. So the top four categories or cohorts, number one is uh, obviously residents of care homes and those who look after them. Um, uh, number two is the over 80s and health and social care staff. So the front line uh, is those two categories in terms of people who look after uh, over 80s and residents of care homes, and then the um, over 75s, and then the over 70s, and those who are clearly to be extremely vulnerable. That is the offer um, that we're delivering on for the mid February target, which is next Monday, not long to go, um, which is the 15 million uh, uh, cohort, and then we go into the, the five to nine. The totality, one to nine, was decided by the JCVI and, and happy to uh, circulate the, their report and their evidence. And then they looked at BAME communities as well as uh, 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 other factors like profession um, and fell very, very um, uh, clearly uh, on the evidence that the one to nine is on clinical um, uh, evidence in terms of severe illness, hospitalization, and death is the right priority, which is what we're doing. So we're following the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization. Okay, um, on, a, on a related theme then, in terms of, um, in terms of the uptake of the vaccination, um, at the end, we talked about trust a second ago, Nadeem. Uh, People are the, in the comments. What's coming through is there's there's a lot of misinformation, particularly on social media. What can the government do uh, to help counter that? And what are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. There is a lot of misinformation on social media, and um, anecdotally, I would say to you that even if I look at my own family, and you know, my family and my wife's family are from the Middle East, where um, you know, as you can imagine, conspiracy theories and Historically, culturally, there's lots of issues there. In many ways, uh, uh, similar to other communities, whether it's the Black and African Caribbean community, and, and the way uh, they have been historically maybe um, mistreated, if I can put it that way, by you know, whether it's big pharma or whatever else uh, it, 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 it happens to be. Um, what are we doing about it? We have set up a cross-government unit 
in the cabinet office, which actually stood up back in March as the COVID uh, disinformation misinformation unit, uh, that now is very much focused on anti-vax misinformation disinformation, and we work with all the technology platforms uh, to alert them as quickly as possible to all this misinformation, and now also sadly scams. Uh, there's a number of people trying to sort of you know, profiteer from uh, people wanting to get their vaccine and, and, and um, you know, uh, they don't know the facts that the vaccines are free, available to any anyone who's eligible for them. Um, and so that unit essentially works with the social media platforms to alert them, try and take these things down as quickly as possible. Okay, uh, Nadeem, thank you. I'm going to just uh, widen this, these two questions out to the panel. Um, Kamla, you're on Sage. Tell us about the prioritisation. Why isn't Sage pushing for ethnic minorities to be particularly prioritised? So, as you know, we, we've given evidence for ethnic minorities, but then there's evidence from schools, there's evidence from occupation. Um, you know, how do we prioritise these groups? And uh, you need a, a simple pragmatic method. And I think the reason our vaccination programs work so well, because this is so simple to implement. There is some evidence base behind it. Um, as uh, the minister said, you know, the nine groups, uh, the first four groups over 70 uh, represent 88% of all the deaths. Uh, the over 50, the nine groups, 26 million represent 99% of the deaths. So if we vaccinate all of those, that's where we're going to reduce the risk of mortality and morbidity. So it makes sense and it's so easy to implement and that's why it's worked so well. If you start saying, let's prioritize someone who has uh, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, let's prioritize someone who who's of ethnic minority. Now, practically, if I, I'm, I'm a general practitioner as well, you know, if you said to me, I've got a white uh, person who is 60 years old and has diabetes, do I vaccinate them first compared to a 55 year old South Asian who doesn't have any diseases? Now that's a really difficult situation, difficult position because quantitatively, I cannot give you a risk estimate for those two people who is at high risk. But there is a, a, the Q COVID risk uh, that, that's been developed, uh, that was published in the BMJ and I was part of that. Mm. That's one yeah. method to take that forward. But I think at the moment we've got something that's working well and we're moving at a pace and vaccinating at pace. And all the high risk groups, in, including ethnic minorities, will be in these populations as well. Yeah, uh, I, I, I understand your argument fully. I guess for people not so close to the data, it's baffling, you see, that yeah. the, the ethnic minorities aren't prioritized. But also, you've mentioned comorbidities there, uh, and the prioritization. Um, is is less on comorbidities and primarily on age. I mean, uh, I accept that that's a, a convenient way to roll out the vaccination, but um, um, an unfit 50-year-old with comorbidities may be at greater risk than a fit 60-year-old, for example, as you know. But if you look at the data, as you said, 88% of people over the age of 70, those are the ones who are represented in the deaths that we've seen so far. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Um I think you've I think you've answered that well. Thank, thanks both to you and, and to Nadim. I want to pick up the point about misinformation and trust. Does anybody else on the panel want to touch on that? Because clearly that's that that's a key factor in this whole debate. Harpreet. Yeah, happy to pick up some of that. So, you know, some of the work I've been doing, uh, not only as a GP, but also uh, leaning in and, and working with NHS England is, is to say, how do we actually then do that practically? So, you know, I mean, one of the things, well, a couple of things that we've been doing, for example, uh, with, with colleagues is, you know, interacting with faith and community leaders to make sure that we are interacting at that level that helps identify these community leaders, those individuals that look like the communities that we want to be representing and working with so that there is a trust element there that Asi has talked about. And they have been hugely positive in terms of how we, we are interacting with them, with their sport and how they've come forward. I think the second thing that we are picking up now is that if we look at the data of where the vaccine hesitancy is, um, actually, surprisingly, there's a, well, not surprisingly, but also importantly, is that it's often between the ages of 18 to 35. You know, that subgroup of population is actually, uh, through social media and various other channels, are getting a lot of this information. And they are influencing often their parents and grandparents. And so we need to think about, you know, not only do we need to target 
uh, those in, in the age groups that we want to vaccinate, but we also need to target those gatekeepers that are often kind of uh, talking about this information and saying whether this is right or wrong. So I take my example as well, as a litmus test, my parents receive all this information I have, uh, and I was in the community and, and people saw that, they would say, this is absolutely true, don't get the vaccine. So we need to make sure that you know, we encompass a wide range of um, individuals uh, who, who can help us dispel these myths, yep. dispel the misinformation, and that requires a multi-pronged targeted campaign. Good, thanks, Harpre. Um, uh, we're going to hear from you. Uh, I tell you what, well. oh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and then we'll go back to Nadim. Nadim, I'd like you to have a a, a, a quick chance to come back. Atia. And so on the on the issue of trust, what we have found is um, during the pandemic, when we recognised trust was um, was a barrier, that uh, there was this gap between formal authorities and um, communities themselves, um, a number of schemes have, have since developed. So the Community Champions Scheme is one example of these people, community leaders, authentic, what we want is authentic representation. But these people holding bridging roles between their communities and the local authorities and having this two-way flow of information. And then also, um, Harpre, what you said in terms of identifying um, who within um, a family unit is the decision maker or exerts influence or conveys that message. So the person that you are targeting in terms of trying to um, increase their trust um, may require engagement with several members of that same family because they, they may not make that decision independently. Mm, good, thank you. Yeah, very important points. Um, Nadim, uh, any, any final comments from you? Yeah, I, I mean, one, uh... Cameron, thank you very much, everyone. And, and I found it invaluable, um, uh, some of the data that uh, Professor Camlish and, and uh, Atia has, has uh, presented tonight. Um, I think we've just got to keep going. Um, and, and the best example of that I can give you is uh, Nikki Kinani, who is the uh, Director of Primary Care at NHS England, who herself is a GP uh, vaccinating in care homes. And uh, uh, when she was doing a care home and they finished with the residents and they were vaccinating the staff, a 60 year old BAME lady said, no, uh, I'm not being vaccinated. You know, vaccinations are not for me or my family. And it took mm -hmm. about four hours of talking to Nikki, sharing information with her, uh, explaining about the process of the, 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 the vaccine discovery, the, the, the three phases, the trials, the safety, the, the regulator, the independence, all this information. Uh, after four hours, just before Nikki was about to leave, she tapped her on the shoulder and said, you know what, I will get vaccinated because it's, it's, it's good for me and good for, for, for my colleagues and my family and my community. And so I think we've just got to make sure, um, uh, you know, we put in place all the, 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 the tools and make them available. Um, uh, Atty just mentioned the 23 million we're putting into community champions to identify those, those people who can uh, share that information. Uh, by the way, your cat is upstaging you. Uh, <laughs> he but, tends uh, to do that, yeah. But, but nevertheless. Um, Easily done. Uh, so this is really important. We've, we are, we've got to sort of almost, you know, maintain the faith in what we know works and share it and scale it. And we will get there uh, together because I think, um, yes, some people might wait and might want just, you know, to, to sort of ask those additional questions. We've got to be prepared to answer them. We've got to make them available in, we're making it available in 13 languages from Arabic to Farsi to Urdu to Hindi to Polish. Um, and that is all part of us making sure that we reach those hard to reach groups. But thank you very much. And I'm sorry I can't stay for the whole of the session, uh, but I, I found it incredibly valuable and, and really grateful uh, uh, to all the practitioners on this call um, uh, uh, for what you're doing. Um, you know, we're going to walk this road together and, and hopefully come out the other end where we've, we've made, you know, every, every, each of, every one of us safe. We've all had, you know, someone we know has been touched by this, this you know, evil virus uh, in many ways. Um, uh, uh, and the, uh, the best way out of this is to protect ourselves through the vaccination programme. Nadim, thank you very much. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Right, we will get back to the original agenda. And now it's over to Deenan to tell us more about the vaccine and vaccinations. Uh, hi, Cam, uh, Cameron. Thank, thank, thank you. I'm. Um, I've got. I, I've got the sort of dry session. So I'm. Um, no, on, no, uh, on. This is what we all want to watch, Dina. What? A, <laughs> what are vaccines? What is the dosing? What is safety? And and what is the impact of these? To what are called new variants on 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 vaccines. So I'm not going to show slides. I'm going to keep it as short as possible, so not to um, interrupt too much this flow of a very important conversation. Um, so first of all, what are vaccines? Vaccines are things that try and pretend to be like their viruses. Yeah, they're, they're, they're things that mimic the virus. So when you get the vaccine, your body thinks it's the virus. And because the body thinks it's the virus, it starts to develop its normal responses, um, which are called the immune response. And they're different sorts of, of, of things. You've heard of antibodies and you may have heard of T cells, different ways in which the body responds to that. That's all vaccines are. But vaccines are not the virus. They're bits of the virus that make the body look like the virus. Um, and so they mimic the infection. And we have, um, we've all heard of a, a, a whole range of different different ways in which vaccines are being produced for COVID-19. Many of them are novel. Um, and actually one of the, not only is the, is it great to see this rollout, but in fact, the fact that we've got vaccines, so many vaccines a year after first identifying the virus, when most vaccines probably take about 15 years from the first identification of the target to when they're actually used. It's just amazing story. Um, and and uh, it, this, therefore this conversation is ever so important about making sure we make, make, make use of it. So we have these viruses, these, these vaccines like the five a vaccine, which is they it uses a bit of a genetic, uh, a bit of the genes of the virus, um, the genetic makeup of the virus to produce the protein that of, of, of the virus and that stimulates the immune response. Um, or the the the, the AstraZeneca uh, virus or the J and Johnson and Johnson, um, sorry, vaccine that'll be coming along. They put that bit of gene from the virus into another virus, which is harmless, and, and that is used as a way of introducing that bit of um, COVID gene into the body, which then makes that protein. But I should say again that none of these none of these vaccines actually bring the genetic material into our own genetic material. This is just a way of delivering in the very short term, mimicking a virus, but a bit of the virus so that the virus doesn't replicate in any way. So it's a really important sort of concept. Um, and, and we've got a whole range of new va vaccines coming along. Um, now, of course, all vaccines have to be under to undergo trials, formal very formal regulated ways of assessing safety in exactly the same way that drugs are done. Um, and, and this is where we come to the dosing because the trials of these vaccines are based on certain doses. Now, I should also say something now about the dosing is that dosing of vaccines is not like dosing of drugs. So for instance, and the GPs here on, on, on the panel will be fully um, conversant with um, someone with hypertension, for instance, not, not responding very well to a drug. One response to that is to double the dose of the drug to see if that will better control the hypertension. That's a very, very different way to the way vaccines work because vaccines are there. They're not the drug in themselves. They're not the immune response in themselves. They're the stimulation of that immune response. And it's a bit more difficult to predict how it, the immune system will respond to one dose or two doses. But often one dose is sufficient for there to be a very good response. So we've got to sort of make sure we don't get into this feeling of, you know, one dose rather than two doses is, is half a good as a, a half as good a vaccine. It's not like a, a, a drug. And of course, the dosing issue has come up purely because we have limited supply of vaccine. Uh, I like the cat. Hope that the cat likes. My <laughs> I think we appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and 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 
Um, and, and because we've got limited supply of, va of vaccine and it's coming in, um, it's not all here as once. If we had completely unlimited supply of vaccine and there was such a mass effort that literally everyone in the population could be vaccinated over a weekend, then of course it would be done in the way according to trials. But we're just being pragmatic about all of this. And I know that there's been some concern about dosing, um, but I think that that needs to be placed in the context that one dose is far far better than no doses and two doses are probably possibly a little bit better than one dose but nevertheless one dose is a key thing so i would just say that about the 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 the, 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 um, the dosing thirdly side effects so um there are two broad sort of categories of side effects of vaccines one of which is the soreness around the vaccine site for the injection. And that's a very common side effect. And that's a consequence of putting whatever it is that's carrying this, this gene or the protein from the, vi from the virus in, it causes some local, local inflammation around the vaccine site. That's one category. Um, and that's a common uh, side effect, not only with this vaccine, but we'll all be familiar with other vaccines that cause those sort of side effects. The other broad category of side effects are in fact side effects that are due to the immune system thinking that you've got a virus. So the immune system kicks in, makes antibodies, loads of chemicals going around the body to get the immune system going. That in fact makes us feel ill. Um, and that's often why, we, why, why, why side effects from vaccines are often confused with side effects from an actual virus, because in fact, it's, it's not the virus causing this, it's, it's just the immune response, and that's short-lived, far more short-lived, and that's why um, 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 side effects such as pyrex temperature, um, muscle acheness, fatigue, headache, those are the sorts of things, the sort of what we call flu-like symptoms that are common. So I think it's, it's fair to say that all the vaccines that are gonna be used do cause in a proportion of individuals some side effects. But I think it's a really important thing to be able to explain that, that, that the people that who are receiving vaccines understand that. And we know that when individuals understand that they may in, indeed experience side effects, they will tolerate those better than if they're a complete surprise. Um, and, and the real severe side effects, there's very, very little evidence of the sort of anaphylactic shock that, um, that has been talked about. Um, um, I, I think we're pretty, the, the following up the vaccines is pretty good at the moment. Um, and then the final thing is about what we've talked about is these variants. Now, all viruses vary and mutate. Um, one of the reasons why we did have flu vaccines every year, we don't just depend on one flu vaccine on, in one year, is precisely because the virus changes and therefore we need to adapt the, the, the vaccine for that. And I think we're starting to see, to some extent, the virus evolving um, and and. And therefore, it may be that in the future, some of our current vaccines may not be 100% effective and may be only partially effective, but that doesn't in no way um, diminishes the importance of having the vaccine now. I think what it does tell us is that we should be expecting um, with this virus that we will have new vaccines or modifications of vaccines, and maybe we'll move to the sort of same model as we see with flu, that many high-risk individuals every year, they get the vaccine that's appropriate for the latest strain of the, of the virus. So I think it's inevitable that these variants will emerge. In no way it compromises wholly the vaccines that are currently there, doesn't in any way diminish the importance of having vaccines, um, the current vaccines, but it does set the scene for us in future having modifications over, over the years in future. So hopefully that's a summary of where of what I've been asked to, to talk about and it sets, uh, and hopefully it's a bit of background for the discussion to come. Thank you, Kana. Yeah, Din, thank you. Uh, great job. <laughs> uh, off the cuff. Well done. Uh, can I ask you just one, a couple of things before we will we'll come back to more issues uh, in the Q&A? Um, a lot of people have asked about this dosing issue. You mentioned a lot about the, you know, one versus two doses. What about the spacing? I think people are um, asking about this and it's been hotly debated. Um, can you can you give the virologist view on this? Um, so in the trials, the spacing was three to four weeks, sometimes up to eight weeks. Uh, with the spacing that we're 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 you know pursuing here in the UK is twelve weeks. Uh, could you explain why that's okay? 
Well, um, <laughs> well, uh, I think this is as always, as I mentioned at the beginning, in the ideal world, we would be giving the vaccines according to the trial protocol that led to the data uh, leading to approval. Now, the AstraZeneca trials, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, those, the trials actually had a variation of dosing intervals from four weeks to 12 weeks. And in fact, more recently, um, data has been, been coming out that in fact, the response, the immune response is better the longer that you wait. So I, I, I think that's absolutely, you know, I think there's no, no problem at all with that. There's no evidence that that delaying to 12 weeks um, will compromise that vaccine from the knowledge data I've seen. The key issue, I think, is for the Pfizer vaccine, where the trial only was for two doses, three weeks apart. And of course, that is where there is far less evidence for efficacy out to 12 weeks, which, of course, is the government um, 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 the, the, the government policy. Um, and so we're having to look at other countries where single doses have been given. Um, and that's why many, many of you will have sort of seen press releases coming out of Israel. Um, unfortunately, only recently, the data that underpins that's become available. But nevertheless, that is where there's been a broad broad Pfizer um, uh, rollout, and in some cases, one dose and not and a delay between the second with the second dose. And there, this is looking as if this is protective beyond the first dose, beyond the three weeks that was within the protocol. So I, I'm starting to be quite more confident that, in fact, getting to the getting a delay with the Pfizer second dose is not going to compromise things significantly. Now, am I saying that everything's OK? Well, of course, everything is a con everything is a balance. And as we've heard, the vaccine rollout has been um, um, amazingly fast. But this is to do with, on the one hand, do we follow the exact trial protocol, which the purists will want? And on the other hand, we have a limited limited supply or or, or uh, before or limited um, um, supply during a period of time do we benefit more people or do we stick to the protocol for a smaller number of people and I, I fall on the side of the JCVI recommendations there and I think that is that is of course better the final okay. thing I would just say yeah. though is, is that the essential thing here is that, and, and this is, I know this is a vaccine discussion, but vaccines are one component of our fight against COVID. And I wouldn't want all of us to be thinking the be all and end all of vaccines. It's also about engaging with testing. If you get symptoms, get tested. If you're part of a household where there's symptoms, get yourself tested. And, and you know, we really need to also ensure that the support is there for individuals to isolate, because of course that's a really difficult thing. But all of these things go together. Vaccines is just one component by which the community, all of us, can contribute to ending the pandemic. Thanks, Dean, and that's um, a, a very, very important point to finish on. Um, it's not just about the vaccine. We need all the other measures uh, operating fully as well. Um, We'll have more questions uh, in due course. Lilu, over to you to give the patient and public perspective. Sorry, just to get myself. Hello, I'm Lilu, um, and I'm trying to. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we can see. Yeah. I'm going to be looking at the uh, public patient view and a um, couple of initiatives. Um, I'm not going to do um, some of this because um, I, I think Atia very um, did it very well earlier, so some of some of it will be repetitive. So just to um, if reiterate that um, South Asians, um, if we're looking at this group in particular, particular um, it's not a homogenous group. But I was going to focus on the um, lower socioeconomic status because in the Sage report as well, um, that's what um, it, it uh, stipulates that this is a group that is more likely to be hesitant. So hmm. just to kind of give an impression of, um, you know, that there are um, differences between generations as well in some of these areas. Um, so for example, you know, the older generation that we've been targeting to now, um, is uh, less likely to be sort of urban areas, whichever part of South Asia they came from, um, and are more likely to rely on 
people uh, who are younger, so the, the younger generations who will be gatekeepers, as um, Harpy mentioned earlier. And um, this uh, uh, people would need to would be using what and video um, it, and, and uh, have, have been quite hesitant because of what they've seen. It's been quite confusing because there's too much information out there. So where they've got kind of a foot in both camps, you know, a lot of news is actually coming from um, India or Pakistan as well as here. So um, that's why there, there is more information than the, the white population might um, might receive. So some of this has been led by Atia. Um, the uh, result is obviously a lack of trust with the personal health care. This is quite different to say the community um, that there was discussion on some of the past um, experiments and, and racism, historic kind of structural racism there. Here this is more sort of um, what people are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis and they've grown up around this and so so you're coming in and saying, well, this this vaccination is really good for you. And I think um, a bit of caution, the discussion earlier that you were having about whether to prioritise this group. I think we need to um, think about what, what it's going to be like saying to somebody, well, you know, um, you weren't a priority before. But also are and how how that might put off people actually um, and wouldn't, wouldn't be helpful sometimes. So it is long term trusted. Um, and some some of the um, discussions I had with people, I think people feel like they um, are between a rock and a hard place at the moment because they're receiving some of this information and they're genuinely scared and they want to do the right thing and they do want um, if it um, it helped. But you've got some of the male, uh, mostly male, uh, who will be saying they won't be affected by COVID, that you know, there isn't the danger. So the perception um, of, of it being a, a big danger isn't there. But I think now people are starting to see um, deaths in the family and they're thinking, well, you know, if I text them, uh, the, the information um, that's coming through is better. And with seeing other people in their communities having that, um, that vaccine is really helping. So um, just a quick round of um, suggestions here, uh, what people have done so far, and it's early moment, um, but uh, a vaccine um, peer support program um, that uh, has been taking place in New York, for example, it's all of the ideas that um, have been discussed here, you know, on a local level um, with lay people who, um, you know, someone can sort of go to and get information and those volunteers also have a drop in session on Wednesday or the they get some public health um, information or from GPs there, they've got that access. So, um, and, and just to We've seen the percentages of people that intended from the Understanding Society that, that intended to have um, the vaccine or didn't. And sometimes that come out in action. So people may say at the time that no, they're not going to have it. They're thinking very different, um, differently about it. And coming through at the moment with lots of translate um, videos that people are putting out there. Um, we need to think about the plain English um, or, or equivalent of plain English um, yeah. on there because uh, that, that uh, you know, just having a simple translation doesn't always equate to somebody understanding it, especially if they um, don't know who NIHR or Medical Research Council is, just saying that, you know, these are the bodies that um, have, have approved it, but they, they may not know. And, and also to start using, um, utilising staff actually um, from local authority, and, um, your own staff who, who are BAME, who, who can uh, promote it. Thank you. Thanks, Lulu. Um, th that's really helpful. Thank you. I think we'll pick up some questions at the end. So um, for you, th there, are, there are various things to address there in terms of community engagement and uh, engaging religious leaders, uh, etc. I'm going to go straight now um, to uh, 
to our next panelist. I'm going to go to who should, I'm going to go to Sue. Could you um, could you tell us about deployment, Sue? Thank you. Yes, th thank you, Cameron. Of, of, of course, I will. So, um, uh, just to kind of uh, uh, sort of repeat the other speakers' comments about um, how much I've enjoyed being part of the session and how much I've learned tonight. I thought I would just do a little bit of where we started, a little bit of where we are now from a deployment perspective, as the, the minister said earlier, um, it's a little bit like setting up an enormous supermarket chain uh, in a month and then sort of increasing it by 20% every week. It's been an enormous undertaking. But we started um, in an environment without any vaccine at all, with a track record of the NHS delivering vaccines successfully for many, many years. It was clear we'd never undertaken anything uh, of such scale that was so important to so many and that needed to be delivered um, at pace. So I think really importantly, although this is led by the NHS, it is very much in partnership and to, to name but a few of those, those partners. We've obviously got the government at a national level, government at a local level. We work with Bayes, with DHSC, with Public Health England, Health Education England. Um, uh, with local communities um, and uh, I think the Minister referenced we've also uh, had the, the, the pleasure of working with the military uh, all the way through. Um, we started with um, uh, the two vaccines which we have, we know we've got more coming along but those two vaccines, the, the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca, created different problems for us, uh, particularly the Pfizer vaccine around how we handled it uh, and uh, uh, those that were able to handle it and store it for us. So also alongside that, we looked at capacity and we stood up capacity really, really rapidly. We're now in a position with over 1,600 uh, different fixed assets or, or facilities or buildings where vaccinations can be given. I think you know those, the hospital hubs, the local vaccination services, which is our primary care led services, um, our vaccination centres, our larger offers, but also on top of that, um, the pop-up or roving models, which I'll talk about a little bit more as well. And because of where we started with these vaccines, it was clear that it was important that we got those vaccines into our hospital hubs in the first place, where we knew they could be stored safely um, and effectively. And as we st stood up the capacity across the country, we were really effectively learning about vaccine and vaccine uptake um, and indeed collecting data and information that would allow us to make um, the right decisions about that vaccine. I think the next thing that we started to do was start to look at uh, the equity of access to vaccine. So very rapidly, we were able to have a vaccine offer within 10 miles um, of uh, anybody living in England, uh, or 98% of people living in England. And in that 2%, we were working with our regions, both health and um, the government regions, to understand how we'd reach those communities with uh, pop-up offers or roving models as well. And I will say, uh, and the, it's been mentioned a couple of times, we follow the JCVI guidance really, really strictly. Um, it does absolutely give us a clear framework following the science about who to vaccinate and when. Uh, and really importantly, it allows us to make sure that we've got what we call cohort penetration. So in other words, we are vaccinating everybody in that cohort and we relentlessly look at that information to make sure that we're looking at all those groups and how we reach them. Moving forward, I think it's really clear that um, a, a sort of a setup that was built a little bit like often described as building a, a plane in, in flight uh, as we learn and develop, a setup that was about bringing individuals to a vaccine isn't always the best way to reach all of our communities. And actually, it's important that we take vaccine to people. AstraZeneca vaccine, the Os Oxford vaccine, has given us much more options uh, around the movement of that vaccine, and it's allowed us to take the vaccine not just to the nursing residential sector and to the housebound, but also to more novel um, vaccination sites and we've seen some fantastic examples of vaccinations being offered um, um, through places of worship across the country, also in other novel settings, so um, on buses, community centres, leisure facilities 
and we're bringing online more and more of community pharmacy offers which sit in the local high street which um, we know that people will often have a trusted relationship within their local community. I think moving forward, um, the information that we've generated, which is becoming um, richer and deeper, it's important that we are sharing that information as locally as possible and that we have less of the decisions made at the national level and more of those decisions taken and owned at a very local level. So we've been sharing that data uh, over the last few weeks and cutting that down to different levels. Um, at the, I've seen today um, a tool, an equalities tool, that we will be sharing with directors of public health, um, uh, hopefully this week, that takes, use, it uses geospacing technology, it looks at ethnicity and deprivation, and it allows you to look down to LSOA level, or indeed a very small population level, to look at vaccine uptake uh, mm -hmm. and to look at that in relation to the vaccine offers locally and to allow those really local decisions to be made. I think that will be really helpful to help with those local conversations that need to be had that are um, often outside um, of the NHS but with faith leaders, uh, with those that are trusted um, in the community as well. And from that I think what's really important is that we're building then that rich, those rich stories and narrative that allow people to uh, understand uh, how they access that vaccine and trust the, the vaccine and the individual that's administrating it as well. So I guess what I'm saying is that we're moving into a position of very much local engagement. Uh, yeah. And the conversation tonight is incredibly timely. So thank you. Great. So thank you. Uh, I think that's building on the points others have made about community engagement, engaging religious leaders. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute or two. Harpre, is there anything you'd like to add at this point before we go to the Q&A? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for everyone. I, I just guess one of the key points I wanted to make was that, you know, we talked about this, but it's really important to know that, you know, ethnic minority population and communities, they're not hard to reach if we bring the services into the community. And I think that's a really important uh, point we have to take about is that, you know, these people, we need to spend where they want us to vaccinate them. And that's why I think places of worship are important. Community centres are important. We've seen some very good examples in Liverpool where the, you know, the GPs in Tox, or Toxtet have been working in the local community centre. They've engaged with medical students. They've you know, brought in people that look, talk like the people that they want to vaccinate. And that is a really important signal we have to give if we want to win the hearts and minds of the people that we need to, to vaccinate. Another example I just wanted to share was the Crawley vaccination bus example. And this is an example of a mobile unit which is going to different aspects of the community to help vaccinate people. So again, taking the vaccines to the people and that accessibility is, is really important because ultimately, yes, we've had hubs, we've had GP practices, but people are often fearful. They don't have the means of the, the transport to get to these uh, areas and, and we have to make it as accessible as possible. So one of the asks putting forward to you know, participants listening today is, come forward with innovative examples because we want to see how we can help uh, and, and spread that message to other communities across the country. Great, Harpy, thank you. Um, I, I just want to thank you and, and the panel for all those uh, really excellent presentations and also participants for uh, so many comments, really overwhelming <laughs> in the chat and the q and I'm going to apologise now. There's no way we can get through all of the questions you've raised. Uh, I hope many of them have been answered by the presentations. I'm going to try and draw out some themes now. I want to build on this theme of uh, community in engagement. And clearly it's not one size fits all. It really depends on the community and which place, um, which demographic we're, we're, we're trying to target. Um, what, are the key, what are the keys in community engagement, do we think? Um, and also I'd like to explore the issue of uh, involving religious leaders because we all know how important uh, a part they play in um, in everything to do with ethnic minorities. Who would like to begin with that? Adia, I think this is right up your street. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So I guess when we're talking about community engagement, we need to be really clear what we mean by community okay. and, and recognising that there are intersections within um, our, our understanding of community. So is community um, simply a geographical location or is community derived based on ethnic identity or religious identity or you know what about people who are 
uh, young people of certain faith. So it's about being clear which community we are targeting and then identifying who the, um, what the best way is to engage those particular types of communities. So for some communities, those will be religious leaders or faith leaders. For others, they will be more um, lay community leaders. So some initial engagement work I did in the earlier stages of the pandemic suggested that the um, official community leaders weren't really representative or, or had you know, the type of influence that we would have uh, expected them to have on certain mm segments of mm. the community but they were more responsive to business owners taxi drivers mm. so it's about identifying who, who who the informal lay community leaders are as well um, and ensuring there is adequate representation and the way that you can do that is by beginning with existing partnerships um, and then using that um, as a starting point to then delve further into the community and understand what the demographic makeup is and then identify um, the best way to engage um, others Good. Uh, yeah, thank you. I know, uh, Kamala, she, what you'd like to chip in here. I was, was going to say, it, it, uh, Atiyah's mentioned uh, and Lilu's mentioned all the interventions that could be done, but they're still heterogeneous communities. Mm. And what we, the, the, leaving it local is really, really important because we know the networks, we know the community leaders, we know the languages, we know the cultures, we know who the influencers are. So I think everything should be from bottom upwards. We need all the messaging coming from the top that this is important in different languages, but the implementation should be really local. And just to give you a quick example, as you know, uh, Cameron, we have a, mm. a Ramadan conference we do every year. Yeah. And at the last Ramadan conference, uh, uh, we were talking about who should fast and who shouldn't fast. Obviously, certain people shouldn't fast, but they still fast. Yeah. And we have a really nice extrovert imam. He said, you could talk to these communities and you tell them not to fast, but they will still fast because they're the religious belief. This is if I tell them not to fast, they won't fast. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the, the, the trick is how do we harness that power? And and I think I proposed CPD for religious leaders. That might not fly, I don't think. But um, it's a big challenge, isn't it? Would anybody else like to comment on the community side of things? I, um, yeah, I, Lily. Um, yeah. I think. Um, I think it depends on the issue that um, you're trying to sort of address. So, for example, um, religious leaders have been great at um, demystifying um, the, that, that there aren't um, animal products, for example, or alcohol and things like that. And that's been great. You know, it's really, um, su supported that and it's been a consistent message. Um, but obviously some of the mistrust and authorities that might come from sort of, you know, more lay people that they know. Um, and even when people see, it's got to be a drip feed, I think, over um, over course of months and stuff. So somebody might see a GP um, giving a message on a video, but then they'll still ask them, I know what you said on the video, but actually what's the real story? And, you yeah. know, thinking that they'll get a different... Oh, I think we lost her. Good. Lily, thank you for that. Um, oh, oh, Dina, yes. Over to you. And then Harpreet. And then next question. I'll move uh, on to that. Yeah. At the risk of, <laughs> Quickly, at, yeah. At the risk of straying into the expertise of others here, uh, I, I do wonder about the, the messaging as to the reasons why vaccination is being given. And and we've got to accept that there, there, it's a complicated message because, of course, the argument has been this is going to protect the NHS mm. by reducing the risk and the highest risk individuals going to hospital. Um, but I, I've got to say, and, and whatever the data says, it is very likely that one of the benefits is vaccination is protecting those around you. You know, mm. There is a community benefit to this. Mm. Um, and I know we're waiting for the data and people get does, asking, does, does vaccine reduce transmission versus disease and so on? Uh, it's pretty, you know, I'm pretty sure that it will show that that is the case. But of course, that is a fundamental community benefit of protecting those around you. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure that there could be a strengthening of those sort of messages as well, um, rather than just uh, that we're going down the priority list and protecting those to stop people going to hospital and so forth. Yeah, yeah, no, good point. It's not just about yourself. It's about your whole community and your family. Thank you, Dina. Harpreet, a quick comment from you, then I'll yeah. take the next question. I'll, I'll give the next question. Yeah. 
Yeah, a quick comment I wanted to make was, and, and the minister also raised this before, you know, you know that one of the most impactful things I've done is, you know, just picking up the phone and talking to people. So whether it's family or friends, you know, often just having that conversation is really, really important. And, you know, an example that we've seen again uh, through a community initiative is kind of the young COVID ambassadors that are being rolled out in West Yorkshire from a BAME background who are talking to people in communities where vaccination drives are you know, meeting resistance. And, and I think you know, with that kind of initiative where you are actually just talking to people, understand their concerns, helping to alleviate them, and distilling this often very powerful, which you may not get through a animation or a video uh, otherwise. So just wanted to share that point. the impact often is by just talking to people, which can be really impactful. Great. Th thanks, Halpri. Um, I want to talk, talk a little more about the science at this point, because clearly the science is one of the reasons why people um, are hesitant. Um, and Dean, and probably this is directed at you initially, and then afterwards we'll talk about household um, transmission and, and what we do and, and how we help there, uh, uh, as we discussed at the beginning. But, but Dean, and we all, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the trials, all, albeit remarkable, amazing, uh, did not record ethnicity. <laughs> um, and if I'm wrong, do tell me. Um, and now we can gather data, per, you know, during the vaccination programs. Uh, how do we, how do we, how do we resolve that? And also, in terms of the emerging evidence based on people being vaccinated now, do you see any uh, differentiation between um, efficacy in? ethnic minorities and others, I guess we don't have enough data at the moment. Dina? So, so and then, and then a really, really important question. I'll focus on the first because you say the second there's less, less, less data around. So um, of course we are right is that all medicines need to be evaluated across all populations. Um, now there's two components of that diversity of populations. Um, one is um, their inherent um, a, a sort of genetic basis to a response to treatment or some other biological reason why there may be a different response to a vaccine or a drug. Um, and let me just focus on, 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 on that to start, to start with. Um, there is little evidence, um, you know, absence of evidence doesn't mean it's not true, but of course there's little yeah. evidence at the moment that there are any significant genetic differences um, around populations in the world around response to vaccines. Um, and in any case, um, you know, I think um, uh, my personal bias is, is there's a lot of overplay here about genetic differences. I mean, there's there's far bigger genetic differences within whites, within Indians, within um, um, Caribbeans, and there are between, you know, these groups. So this is a this is a sort of bit of a flawed argument. I think a mar far bigger when we're talking here about the, the risk and we're talking about ethnic minorities, a far bigger risk is exposure is that and, and this is comes back to the list of priorities for vaccines actually it is about you know those groups of people who cannot prevent themselves being exposed to um to vaccine whether it's because they're in multi-generation households or whether it's because of the work they do the public facing work they do i think that 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 is is an issue so i think that here it's not necessarily just about vaccine does the vaccine response in a south indian any different from a caucasian white i, I think that's a less of an uh, 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 an issue to be perfectly honest now where and of course another Another sort of complication here, finally, about the trials is that many of these trials have been done, uh, the, the manufacturers say, um, this is great, it's been done in many countries of the world. So we've got the, you know, many groups in Brazil, many groups in South Africa, many groups and so on. And so then they say, so we have tested it across many ethnicities. But of course, what we're talking about here in this conversation yeah. is that is that coalescence of de social deprivation, racism, as well as you know any other factors that which are not captured in? Do you see what I mean? So I think there's no, a absolutely. danger yeah. in going down the ethnicity yeah. thing, almost like yeah. it's a called genetic determinism, and I don't yeah. buy that to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that would be my take on on that 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 question, Cameron. Yeah, I mean, when you're essentially saying it's a, it's really a, a it really depends on social determinants and inequities, which is I think we, I hope we'd all agree with. Uh, Kamlesh. 
Yeah, so if you look at the trials, they did have uh, ethnic minorities um, uh, between 12 and 20 percent. The AstraZeneca had uh, uh, South Asian groups. Um, the uh, Pfizer vaccine had uh, more black populations. But the numbers of events is so small that it's very difficult to look at uh, uh, events by ethnic minorities. And also, this isn't like a, a, a drug trial where you... Blink Sorry, I thought they hadn't recorded ethnicity in the trials. No, they, they, they've come back and said, said that they, they, they have reported how many people there were. Right. So retrospectively? Yes, retrospectively. All right, okay. But, All right. But there's so many other things that are going on. It's very difficult to tell whether it's going to be more effective in certain populations because there are lots of other factors, background um, uh, uh, rates of infections, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, how much people are complying to, uh, how many people are living in the house and the viral load. So it's, it'll be very difficult to tell whether it affects one population more than other. But as Dean and said, this should uh, be applicable to all the population. The other factor is we're still doing vaccine trials and we're still having difficulty recruiting to vaccine trials from mm. black and minority ethnic health populations. No matter how we hard we try, unless there, you know, we have 50% uh, of uh, people from ethnic minority backgrounds, we're still struggling to get 20, 30% people into vaccine trials. Yeah, thanks, Kamesh. Would anybody else like to comment on this? And I've got, I'm going to move on to household uh, transmission. Okay, well, let's. I mean, you mentioned exposure, Deenan, and uh, I think, Kamlesh, at the beginning, you said, you know, one of the most important variables here is um, household conditions and uh, large households, um, a very important factor in transmission. We know that's a fact. What's the solution? How do we get over that? Because people can't suddenly change their household circumstances. I mean, one of the things, so if you look at uh, Korea, if anyone's infected, they take them away. They don't keep them in the household. And that's one of the solutions is we have highly densely populated houses. Uh, we have multi-generation families. And maybe if someone is infected, you take them out, give them supported environment where they mm. can safely isolate, obviously, with all the monitoring, etc. That's the only way we could do this. As, otherwise, there's a huge uh, uh, um, risk that they will spread to the others. And we've seen that. We've had uh, three generations of families living together who have really been wiped out because of, of COVID. That's the only solution. Obviously, all the advice that we give to try and protect themselves to, in the first place to reduce the risk of getting infection is an important one. But once someone has the infection, probably best supported isolation outside of the household. Okay, yeah, and just to make people aware, once you take them out, you do bring them back, don't you, Kamlesh, once they're here? Yeah. Okay. Um, the mother or the mother-in-law. Yeah, very true. Uh, Dean, and then I wonder if Adia Lili or one of the other panellists would like to comment, because there's a beha strong behavioural element here. Uh, Dean? I mean, all, all I'd add to Kamlesh's um, uh, 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 comments is that here is, here is a, in my view, a level of granularity of, of the social determinants of disease, which we know for COVID exists, where in fact targeted vaccination could work outside of the sort of this, this, this tiering of, of priority list. Because clearly, you know, if you have multi-generation households in whom um, one person is in a very public facing sort of job and therefore is very much more highly exposed. You can, you know, as Kamlish has said, you know, it's clear that there is a lot of household transmission next to healthcare settings. Households are the place where transmissions are going on indoors. So these are ways, but we need to then, there needs to be a willingness to actually look at the data and, 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 and actually make that as a political decision to be made. I would fully support that approach. Thanks, Dina. Uh, Adia, Lilu, Harpreet, on, on the behavioural yeah. side? Yeah. Yes. Adia, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I completely agree with the out of house quarantine option, and not only necessarily for the person who is infected, but for the family members who have to, as you say, go out and work and are in high, high risk um, or you know, high exposure um, jobs, um, that those could be. The, the family members who um, are offered um, out of house accommodation to manage the risk. Um, it's um, and it's very complex when we talk about what's happening within the household. So there's an element of communications. How are people negotiating, implementing measures? Uh, there's an element of um, care responsibilities. So you've got the risk uh, from not just older people to younger people to older people, but also older 
family members to younger family members and how they manage the risks if somebody is suspected or has um, um, you know has symptoms for example how that's managed and how the care care responsibility is managed um, but then also um, the, the challenges around um, the physical property we know that you know people in ethnic minority groups um, are in more deprived areas and the housing uh, stock itself is not of good quality so there are issues with um, damp or you know um, difficulties ventilating exacerbating some of those um, physical health conditions so it's it's very complex but in terms of what can be managed it is as you've said out of house accommodation supporting communications but then also possibly providing some um, practical support you know, carers coming into the home um, in, in a controlled, managed way to look after family members who are cared, uh, need to be cared for, um, providing meals, read, ready-made meals, so people have less shared time in the kitchen, for example. So there are things that we can still do. Um, we just need to sort of move beyond what, and you know, provide that wider support, I think, um, and move beyond what an individual can do. Good, Adia, thank you. Would anybody else like to chip in on that? Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to move to, um, I, I, I beg the pardon of all the panellists and the, and the audience because we're going over time, but I, I'm such a fascinating conversation, I'd like to continue a little bit. Uh, we've talked about taking vaccination into the community, once we've defined what community is. Um, people have mentioned using pharmacies, education, you know, schools, universities. How do we get the vaccines? Uh, to the community uh, beyond prime beyond the general practice. So, 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 so yeah, sorry. So, yeah. so I think probably the, the 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 first thing to say is that at at the moment we're working in an environment where we've still got a constrained vaccine supply, and I think so we are having to monitor every single vaccine and where it goes as soon as it arrives in the country it's dispatched to um, its point of vaccination and we follow that really closely um, there even within that we have found ways to safely move the vaccine um, from the fixed assets into people's homes into places of worship uh, and we're doing that more and more. One of the challenges is around the size that the, the packs the vaccine arrive in. So we're, we're working uh, to make sure that we can break those down into smaller packs that mean we can distribute that more readily and actively. Um, and we've created the hospital hubs because they are and um, uh, a chain of transport infrastructure that allows us to move that vaccine around. So it's, 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 in, it's entirely possible. We're also creating a standard operating procedure that, if you like, gives you the, the simple instructions about what you would need to do to set up a facility like that safely, whether it's around the infection prevention and control elements or around the storage of the vaccine once it's there. So all of those things are possible. And when we get a, a more of um, an unconstrained vaccine supply, we'll be doing more and more of that. We're doing some of it already, but we'll be doing more and more moving forward. Good, thanks. So I guess my question is, um, um, is building on that as well too, which is to say, and ask the other panelists, what do we know? Uh, we've talked a lot about the barriers, the problems, We've talked about solutions, but actually, what do we know works? What 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 works in terms of getting more people from ethnic minorities vaccinated? Do we know anything? Do we have the research? Yeah, there is yeah, evidence. Yeah. Go on, yeah. then. What is it? You tell uh, absolutely. us. Absolutely, there, there is an evidence base for it. You know, yeah. increase people's knowledge. So. Um, uh, educational resources, you know, the, the, the open dialogue is all about increasing, um, uh, yeah, addressing misinformation, for example, but this, the strategies that I shared earlier were all based on um, evidence of, um, yeah, evidence of empirical research that has shown vaccine uptake, um, in increases in, in, um, in vaccine uptake in um, minority ethnic communities. So, um, you know, uh, earlier, just this relates to one of your, your, your comments earlier about CPD for religious leaders, but actually the evidence shows training religious leaders and community leaders, um, there's an evidence base for that approach, wow. giving them the right um, skills. I knew there would be. Yeah, so, <laughs> no. so I'd say what we've shared today is, is all evidence based and, and... Very good, yeah, thank you. 
Any other thought, Kamlesh? Yeah, just, just I think we're we're way behind the low middle income countries here. So if you look yeah. at if you look at Africa, if you look at India, Africa they've they've tried to sort out the HIV problem through community engagement. It's all mm. done through community engagement. If you yeah. look at the rural parts of India, some fantastic trials coming out from there, working with the communities to increase uptake of health check programs and reducing mortality rates in those. Programs. So they've been doing this for many, many years in, in these countries, and, and that's the, exactly the same model we need to bring in here through our community uh, 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 engagement officers, through our religious leaders, using the languages that we all know within those communities. Uh, and they will also tell you the barriers and solutions as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the chat, I noticed somebody's mentioned burfi, samosa, um, uh, that must mean time is up. Um, I'm going to go around the panel and ask you for one final comment, um, and then I'll wrap up. We'll go back in the order that you spoke. Kamlesh. Uh, it's been really a great session. Thank you, everyone, for contributing. What I think I've learned is there's so many solutions that came up that I wasn't aware of from various people on the panel, and I've seen some on the chat as well. And I think having a library of those potential solutions would be a, a great start so that we can share that with everyone. Great. Thanks, Kamlesh. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, for me, it would be to see yeah, what, what we can see from today's um, webinar is that there is a real appetite and a willingness uh, for, for everyone to move forward with this and engage with communities. And I think that's one one good thing that we now have that we didn't have at the earlier stages of the pandemic, those partnerships with communities um, that didn't exist. Um, some of those now exist and we should really capitalise on those and, and sustain those and make sure we don't lose them, not only after um, this initial sort of um, vaccination programme, but just more broadly speaking, you know, we, we need to keep that mm. two way dialogue going with with communities. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dina. Um, a great session. I've I've learned a, a, a lot. I mean, I think the the success to date of the the the, the program, uh, vaccination program, is no doubt because it's been based within the NHS, which of course has a, a lot of trust amongst the community, but it's not a hundred percent trust. And so we've got to learn from other areas of mistrust of the health service. That I know that that many primary care, community care, and hospitals are having to deal with in many parts of the country. Um, and so I think there's a lot of learning that can be done from that as well to sort of to, to, to narrow that gap of coverage. Thanks, Dina. Nilu. Thank you. I've, I've also learned lots here. Um, one of the things I think I've picked up over the past few weeks is how very careful we with our messaging when there's been lots of messaging that's been coming through to communities already. And I guess um, I would say we probably need to be a little bit less risk averse. And, you know, this kind of community connection that's happening is really great. And just let people, um, you know, have more of a sort of bottom up um, communication and, and just support people and communities to do that rather than, um, you know, trying to trying to make it fixed and, and saying how people ought to um, communicate. So. Great. Thank you, Lily. Sue. Thank you, and thank you for um, having me here. I guess I'd say the programme has been really successful today, but I think the future success of the vaccine programme really relies on our engagement with local communities. So we are definitely here engaged and wanting to work with you. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Sue. Harpreet, perhaps you could also tell us, Harpreet, what, what will happen following, you know, as a follow up. How will we share this information? Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for everyone for joining today, including all the participants uh, and the panelists. So we will put a summary of the findings uh, uh, on our website and share that uh, widely, uh, as well as um, the video of this webinar that will go on our website as well. But if I can just pick up on three quick points to add to that. One is the one that we've taken away, which is, you know, how we can potentially skill up frontline workers and pre-educators. And I think that's a really useful suggestion. The second is, like Sue said, this is a really good opportunity for us to build on this as a legacy for future deployments as a GP I know this is a really unique moment where we can work much closely with the community uh, and build those relationships and networks and I think that's hugely exciting and then thirdly I think a question was asked about 
whether the vaccine is, is safe to be taken during Ramadan? And the answer is yes. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll make sure that we dispel um, some of these myths and, and provide the right information on the South Asian Health Foundation website, where we are collecting all the resources to do share with us any excellent community, community initiatives, any information you have, so we can put it all on our webpage. Thanks, Harpy. And, th and this session will be available to watch as well. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. Um, listen, I really appreciate the time the panel's taken here. It's been a really uh, enlightening session. We, we're really grateful to Nadeem Zahawi for joining us today and for kicking things off and for taking our questions. <laughs> um, so, so and, and good luck with all your work. Um, I apologise to any participant who feels um, that their questions were not answered. Uh, we just had so many. It was very, very difficult. We appreciate your engagement. It made it very difficult to get through all your questions. But we, this, is, this is the beginning of the dialogue. It's going to be an ongoing conversation. We need you to support Supporters, stay with us, work together and solve this problem. Uh, fundamentally, though, in the long term, the only way to solve this is to, as Michael Marmot uh, wrote in his report before Christmas, is to build back fairer, create a fairer society where social determinants, inequities do not affect our communities in the way that they do today. Um, so that's the long term goal. And that's something we must all fight for. So I want to thank you all. Um, Stay safe and get vaccinated. Thank you so much. Goodbye.